Hey everybody, it's Will here. Uh, just a slight introduction to this week's show. Uh, it features our conversation with none other than the great Bill Corbett, who you may remember from a little show called Mystery Science Theater 3000. And for this episode, we knew we had to do a movie with Bill, and the movie we discussed is Hillary's America by filmmaker, entrepreneur, Christmas tree entrepreneur, <laughs> by filmmaker and Christmas tree entrepreneur Dinesh D'Souza. Um, I think it fits in perfectly with both the Chapo and MST3K canon because it is both abominable and hilarious. So uh, we had a lot of fun doing this with Bill. I want to thank him again for uh, coming to the Trap Mansion and uh, spending some time with us. We had a great time with him, and I think you guys are really going to like this episode. Bye. I was a little. We actually watched uh, this movie for the first time last night, and I was a little worried going into it. I was like, "Oh, God, Christ! What if it's just really boring and dry? And we don't have anything to talk about." But man, oh man, uh, I'm so glad. <laughs> oh my! It, was, it, it delivered so well. As soon as I saw the saw the like 60 foot Stay Puft Marshmallow Man <laughs> <laughs> Hillary in the opening credits, I knew we were in for a good time. It was it was so so good. What if the goal? of the Democratic Party is to steal the most valuable thing the world has ever produced. What if their plan is to steal America? I mean, I guess let's just begin with sort of a... The general observations about the movie. Like, I think the movie, it's easy to talk about because it sort of breaks down neatly into to four quarters. There are sort of four parts of the movie, each with their own uh, charms. But just o- overall, I guess my like first reaction to this movie, this is the first Dinesh documentary I'd ever seen. And I guess my first reaction is uh, that someone as ugly as Dinesh D'Souza would choose to put himself and his face yeah. so often in this movie is <laughs> amazing to me. I mean, like, not even Michael Moore is that shameless in, in his documentaries. Yeah, this was, Th- uh, this mo- <laughs> oh, this was also my first D'Souza joint, and uh, I, yeah, he is just aping Michael Moore, but when Michael Moore puts himself in his movies, it's funny, because he's a big fat guy, and he's eating in all the scenes, and he's got, like, shit on his shirt, and it's like, that's it's comic relief. When D'Souza shows up, he's just this elfin, overgrown college Republican. This movie may not star Vincent Chase, but it definitely does have a turtle. <laughs> <laughs> and just the other thing is, like, just overall, he, like, he makes movies for people who have never seen a movie before. Like, that, that, that yeah. was, like, really the style of it. Like, someone who, uh, Matt, could you... Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, know- it's... it's, it's- only for people wh- whose last film experience was in a Nickelodeon. <laughs> I mean, the film ends with a fireworks display. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. The spoiler alert, a fireworks display and someone singing like the long version of the Star Spangled Banner with the weird lyrics about like, you know, Hiberians or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and it made me realize that, that this actually, that this movie, Hillary's America, is the real life version of the movie from The Ring. In that everyone who saw it died seven days later, only of old age. <laughs> when the rocket's red glare, Greek people don't breathe air. <laughs> By the way, we know some lawyers. If your uh, grandparent in the nursing home was one of you know 5,000 people in America that saw Hillary's America and broke their hip standing up to salute the national anthem at the end, we want to represent you. <laughs> yeah. Better call Saul. Right? <laughs> Better call Saul Alinsky. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, perfect. A major- Episode title. <laughs> so, like, that, that's like, the overall presentation in the movie is, is uh, bizarre, just sort of, like, really ham-fisted and, uh, like, poorly done. I think, Matt, you said it was, like, the longest campaign ad ever made. Oh, yeah. I mean, the way that they talk about it, those, it's, like... Whole sections are just the Democratic Party did racism. Yeah, and it's just it has the the tone of a of a of a really bad campaign commercial. You, you, you thought the Simpsons put that to bed, the sort of minor chord underscoring the, the commercial <laughs> thing, but no, it's like 
75 minutes of that. The other thing, like the content of the movie is also fascinating because like, overall, it's, it's interesting to watch this movie now, especially. This is a movie that came out this year, of, of, of artifact of the very recent past that is nonetheless stunningly out of whack with present day reality on a number of yeah. levels. Like not only... Yeah. Is Trump actually the president? There is a lot in the in the beginning and end of this movie that sets up Vladimir Putin and Russia as our chief antagonists, and they're like, "If in Hillary's America, America's enemies will be in power." And then there's like a you know like a sort of a shot of Vladimir Putin stepping off a you know a plane or something like that. He and also he also made the error of assuming that racism would still be an antagonist right now. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. right. We we talked about how you know the first part of the movie is the Democrat like him showing the Democrats and. You know, the, the, him going, um, and then they uh, said, more racism, please. But then you think about, like, the Trump people that he's marketing this movie to. He's like, he has to take time to explain, like, no, 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 that's bad. Slavery is actually bad <laughs> because uh, it's like uh, socialism. <laughs> yeah, there's a speech where they have Ben Tillman, who is a post-Reconstruction Democratic senator, talking about the need for them to be a white party. And you just wonder... Well, what are they th getting out of this? Are they like, maybe these Democrats have something <laughs> yeah. going for them? Yeah, I'm sure most of these guys would think Charles Sumner was a big pussy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, like, as as a as a documentary filmmaker and as really, like, the, the star of the movie, like, uh, his main trick in this movie is adopting this kind of fake, wide-eyed naivety about everything. <laughs> yeah. And he presents himself as like a scholar who's nonetheless completely ignorant about basic facts about American history. But the thing is, that's what he thinks of his audience. The Democrats support slaves. He gives this kind of, uh, gives facts about American history that, like, this is the secret history of the Democratic Party that is also covered in middle school <laughs> right, American right, history. Right. And, like, you know, like, that is the contempt he has for, the, for his audience, is that, like, he, he pretends to be as ignorant of these very basic facts as he assumes the audience is, but it, which makes for a funny, uh, comedic juxtaposition because he has to take pains over and over again to say no no the democrats were for slavery which is bad it took it too far <laughs> every time that he stumbles on one of these because he's a shitty actor too he just makes this face like you know his dog just farted it <laughs> what that's the best part of the movie is yeah. like him bumbling around the world and he makes it into like the hillary campaign quarters but the conceit is that they have this secret room where they're like, do not let Dinesh in here. Right. This has all the files proving we're racist. <laughs> that, that is I don't Andrew know why Jack. we didn't burn them and keep them in one room behind an unlocked door that it Dinesh really was, just walk it, into. It, it really is just like a very shitty national treasure sequel. <laughs> yeah. He literally found Andrew Jackson's bloody slave whip down in the, <laughs> the DNC yeah. basement. Yeah, 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 yeah. People yeah. find out that Andrew Jackson had slaves. This whole thing's going down. And like the other main trick, of the, like his main trick is in narrator like i said is this fake naivete about everything where he's like discovering did you know andrew jackson was responsible for american indian genocide what imagine it's white genocide audience <laughs> <laughs> but the, the main tool of like the, the the movie itself or the argument that the movie is advancing is this idea that uh the republican and democratic parties have not changed at all over the 180 years that the film covers not only with... their ideology but the actual people like yeah, it's like yeah. the <laughs> same human beings <laughs> who are 300 years old now look everyone in congress is a highlander i thought we knew that. <laughs> this is established fact so that there are these sort of four parts of the movie and, it, and the movie begins with the fact that he's like uh his his obama documentary was so successful that he was sent and, to and jail. It definitely kept yeah. him from getting reelected. Yeah, it yeah. was the it worked. purpose it shows of it. Secret tapes of Obama being like, um, I order you to double the deficit <laughs> and uh, imprison Dinesh for telling the truth. <laughs> My judgment. Dinesh D'Souza was sentenced on Tuesday to spend eight months in a confinement center. It all began when the Obama administration tried to shut me up so yeah no, it begins with uh, a, a reenactment of his trial where he was uh, indicted for violating campaign finance laws by i mean the, the story is he used straw donors two of which was his girlfriend and her then husband to bypass the limit of money that you're allowed to give to his friend wendy long it's the first cuck campaign violation <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's like money ball cuck ball <laughs> So the first quarter of this movie or so, it begins with the reenaction of his judge being like, 
for the crime of believing in the Constitution. We are sentencing you to therapy. Yeah. yeah. Dinesh, Dinesh starts saying the Pledge of Allegiance, and he's like, throw that man in contempt. <laughs> so, uh, Dinesh's like, poor me version reenactment of the judge is exactly how Carl Diggler feels about his family court judge. <laughs> to say, you are going to prison. You will never see your son again. <laughs> so, like, going from that reenactment, it, he does a reenactment of his actual incarceration, which we should be clear took place evenings and nights at a halfway house an hour from his home in San Diego. But when he yeah. when he gets in the halfway house, it first of all looks like a CIA black site prison. Or the and, Chicago Police Department, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and every criminal in there is like, hey, I'm in here because I murdered 20 people for my gang. Right. By the way, Republicans are racist. Yeah. <laughs> and it sets up what Dinesh is going to do. Well, when, when Hillary, they're watching the TV and Hillary announces... And they're all huddled around the TV. She announces, and they they literally cheer like all the, all the gangbangers. Like that's our girl. I can't wait to vote for her four times. I'm with her. Yo, it's a woman's time. <laughs> She's battle tested, motherfucker. <laughs> so like, this is the Oz part of the movie. Yeah, yeah. Just like, very much so. Dude, yeah, she, we're putting you. We're putting you in Emerald City, away from Gen Pop. It's our yeah. experimental unit for political prisoners. Adabisi is in there. Uh, Simone, Simone Adebisi, you have a call with David Brock. <laughs> <laughs> Another detail I noticed when he was in prison, he's like, I just have to have to focus on my books. And in prison, he's reading a book that's just called The Democratic <laughs> Party. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, it's, sort of like, it's sort of like music band on Steve Buscemi's. <laughs> yeah. so Dinesh, like, he, he's like, I'm going to make the most of my time in prison, which is learning about the Democratic Party, but also learning the power of street knowledge, as yeah. Public Enemy once said. And he gets hip to crime and gang from, let's be honest, the other white collar criminals he was probably in right. jail with. Yeah, yeah that's, could, well, that's the thing. That, like, he has a little talk with the guard beforehand, and he's like, yeah, the people in here are mostly for white collar stuff. But then they kind of imply, like, well, yeah, but there are people here who can't leave, and they're really scary. And, like, if I had just gotten that, the implication is if he had just gotten a little more of a bad sentence, he could have gotten, like, in a real scary place. But it's like, so you're saying that Obama didn't, give you the really scary punishment that he could have but he's also a horrifying dictator he's just making you stay overnight at this place yeah. with a bunch of nerds we we had this storyline we wanted to do with diggler once where he gets thrown into father's jail which is a special <laughs> prison they put guys who get thrown in contempt in family court in and it was basically this i actually found a, there was a vanity fair profile of uh, dinesh d'souza about his life after conviction and it talks about how he he eats dinner every night at the subway sandwich shop uh right outside the halfway house because he like never wants to be late because he figures if he shows up a minute late Obama's going to throw the book at him. So he shows up at 8 o'clock every night, and uh, this is what Dinesh said in the, in the article. I'll be on my bed. I'll hear four guys discussing the tits on a woman at Los Tacos. It will go on and on and on. I'm just powerless to move. <laughs> so there are all these scenes of him, like, you know, on his bunk bed. And, but like, wait a minute. They showed him, like, an exercise yards and eating in a chow, like a cafeteria. Oh, yeah. I don't think he actually did any of that. The, yeah, the depiction of his time in prison is astoundingly fraudulent even if yeah. you don't know the details of it because okay so he's in a halfway house and he has to check in at eight o'clock every night then he creates i think a composite character in the figure of rock rock let's talk yeah. about let's talk about that guy rock who's a gang leader who like like i said gives dinesh street knowledge it's sort of like how malcolm x converted to islam in prison. <laughs> dinesh converts to crime in prison and rock is like yo yo my, my man dinesh yo, yo this is how this is how this is how it goes yo and then rock proceeds to out lay out for him uh he was like it worked like this i was in a gang that sold people fraudulent life insurance, insurance. Claims. <laughs> big and then, thing amongst the blood oh, scripts. Yeah. Latin yeah. King's number one source of income. So he, he sold sort of elderly people posing as community leaders and organizers, sold them fraudulent life insurance claims, and then murdered them. They literally <laughs> went to their apartment <laughs> and just fucking whacked them. Yeah. There, there, there's, in one of the reenactments, yeah. they show a guy in a wheelchair getting stabbed in the neck, like <laughs> right. just getting shanked like 30 <laughs> times in the neck. And he's like, and if a witness wanted to say something about it, we took care of that too. And then it's just like, <laughs> 
pop in a car. <laughs> yeah. And then he's like, well, as long as I get here by eight o'clock every night, things are pretty <laughs> yeah. much okay. Yeah. Right. And, <laughs> and, and, yeah. and they and he won the respect of Rock and all and all the badass cons by playing chess. Remember? Yeah. Oh, like, there's a scene that, where that he's made like, him huggy <laughs> huggy bear. Like, yeah, Rock. Like, Yo, you good at chess, my man? And he's like, actually, Why, I am. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rather good. Rock played by uh, Michael Rapper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rock is played uh, breakout character. Rock played by Michael Rappaport <laughs> for for a scene. Hey, Duke. Obama's whole style is chump. <laughs> no. Prison is all about discovering your hidden talents and impressing everyone, such as with your chess ability. I didn't. I didn't have time to get back to the halfway house before Subway closed, but they're catering subs. He's, Everything's coming up to Nash. Nash <laughs> learns about how crime works in jail. What did I learn? All crime is about stealing. And then a light goes off in his head where he's like, what if the way criminals act are the way the bigger criminals act, i.e. the Democratic Party? And as you said, Bill, there's, there's scenes where they're in the rec room in jail and they're watching CNN and Hillary's just like, I want to be your president. And then like, you know, the leader of the black gorilla fam is like, pantsuit nation, bitch. <laughs> Everyone from MS-13, the Mexican mafia, Aryan Brotherhood, the blood. But like, I also like, uh, like, and uh, when he talks to Rock, Rock is like, the real criminals, those are the Republicans. They're straight up racist, yo. <laughs> yeah. And that's just, just like, if only I could reach out and yeah. teach my brother Rock the true history yeah, right. of the R Democratic Rock, Party. Rock, who just admitted to killing like 80 elderly people. <laughs> Which sort of, and, and that gets into like the, the second, and I feel like basically the first half of this movie is all about slavery. It's bad, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, well, I don't... <laughs> which Dinesh handles in a very tasteful way in many reenactments. But like, so once he gets, <laughs> once he gets out of jail, then it gets into this this secret history of the Democratic Party, which begins by Dinesh going to a building that says Democratic Party, just yeah, like the book, right. and he walks in, and like the Democratic Party headquarters is basically a museum of the history of the Democratic Party that has like video displays of Debbie Wasserman Schultz like saying like. We're going to empower young people and do social justice. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they have a, a flag with 57 stars on it. <laughs> <laughs> and then in, a, in a, a, a motif that's repeated again and again uh -huh. in this movie, Dinesh goes to the Democrat Museum, but then goes off tour, goes <laughs> under like the, the caution tape into a, an area marked top secret employees right. only please don't go in here the lock's right. broken right. Yeah. incriminating file room <laughs> do not enter <laughs> he finds the secret room in Democratic Party headquarters with the big box of files marked racism <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he to be fair we do have a box like that in our office <laughs> and he begins to investigate the, the secret history of the Democratic Party now before we get into Dinesh's version of American history I think it's worth uh, going back into the uh, recovered history, the secret history of Dinesh D'Souza himself. So does this mean that you went to the Dinesh D'Souza headquarters and went into the room that was marked no access? Uh, no, just like some uh, recent, uh, of recent vintage Dinesh has, you know, uh, on social media, has uh, called Obama a grown-up Trayvon Martin. Uh, posted a photo of Obama taking a selfie under the with the headline, "You can take the boy out of the ghetto, but you can't take the ghetto out oh of the boy." Jeez, what a piece of shit. Um, he also uh, he had a like a like an image macro of Obama, and it was like, "Here's my position on beheading. I beheading to the golf course." <laughs> Yo, we do be like wow. that though. Wow, dead but ass. We're Obama though. Basically. A third of this movie is is Dinesh saying how horrible the racist history of the Democratic Party is and that the Republicans are the real party of social justice and racial equality. Uh, and, and funny, when I was looking up reviews of this movie or like the Dinesh's sort of second career as a documentary filmmaker, I was stunned by like how many media outlets like The Atlantic and like The New Republic that were writing articles along the lines of what happened to Dinesh D'Souza? Mm. But it's just like he was always this fucking person. He was always a piece of shit. For right? his entire career, like he outed gay students at Dartmouth. Dinesh, uh, yeah, he was like a college Republican at Dartmouth who... Uh, those are like, those are like Ultra college Republicans. Yeah, that, that's mm -hmm. like in the parlance basing. of uh, the Devil's Playground, they would be the Shia <laughs> yeah. of right. college Republicans. The most ferocious, the most logical ferocious Cla classmate of Laura Ingram too, right? Yeah, yeah. they yeah. dated, I believe. Oh my god. Um, but yeah, he was editor of the the, Dar the Dartmouth Review, which was this sort of conservative journal, and which he uh, authored um, a, a satire of affirmative action uh, called "Quote This Show Ain't No Jive, Bro." 
that include it was from the perspective of a recently matriculated student, a black student oh. coming to Dartmouth who says things like, "Now we be coming to Dartmouth and be up and over frozen studies, but we still not be graduating Phi Beta Kappa." Oh, that's <laughs> stunning. So, Jesus. Uh, he also, under his editorship, the paper published a lighthearted interview with a former member of the KKK, which was accompanied <laughs> Those by... Those guys are such goofs, man. Which was accompanied by a staged photo of a black man hanging from a tree. And he also attended meet- meetings of uh, a gay student group and took down their names and outed them in the paper, several of which were still closeted to their parents. I mean, an absolute scumbag. Look, look, not all his articles are bad. Uh, What about Operation Paperclip? 40 years of laughs. (laughs) (laughs) After Dartmouth, he uh, he sort of he he, uh, was in the Reagan administration and sort of like a standard conservative policy wonk. But he sort of broke out with publishing a book about called Illiberal Education that did very well and was reviewed very well. That was sort of an attack on PC culture in the early 90s. He then sort of squandered that by writing a book called The End of Racism in which he argued that, quote, the old forms of discriminations have declined and instead been replaced by what he calls rational discrimination based on accurate group generalizations. He refers to, uses words like uh, parasitic to describe the uh, relationship between black people and the government. Mm. And um, also, he among his assertions, this is in the book, he says, slavery in this country was not actually based on race, and that if we're going to discuss America owing black people reparations for slavery, then what do blacks owe America for the abolition of slavery? <laughs> he, also, he also, in this book, riffed on the widely different personalities developed during slavery, including the playful Sambo, the sullen fe- field hard N, I'm not going to say it, the sullen field hard N, fill that in in your head, hard R, sorry, the dependable mammy, the sly and inscrutable trickster, all of which he claimed were still recognizable <laughs> in present-day African-American culture. He, ne- he never managed to use the word mandingo in there. <laughs> I'm sure he did. I didn't read the whole book. So that, these are Dinesh's like actual attitudes about black people and black culture, yeah. which is funny. Yeah, and then, and then he gets, which is, of course, just opposed to how he presents him, his, this, his wide-eyed belief in, the, in how bad and awful black people were treated by the Democratic Party in this country, which begins with his portrayal of Andrew Jackson. Who was a you know a slaver, an Indian killer, and a raper? He made special uh, account to show him uh, inviting uh, a slave into his bedroom, and then uh, he I think he uses the line, "What is it with Democratic politicians and vulnerable young women?" <laughs> I did enjoy the performance of the guy who was playing Andrew Jackson because he was basically like a racist benny hill <laughs> like he was like he would like look at the the slaves and then they would get like boing, 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 boing. Yeah. like his eyebrows would start waggling. that's a nice <laughs> <laughs> the movie is filled with these historical reenactments and uh like a lot of it which takes place on the floor of congress and like their set for that i think was just like the uh the lunch room at a country club yeah, yeah. and they, they use a bunch of community theater actors there it's like yeah. the, they had no wig budget at all oh my god was, like, John C. Calhoun's wig John was a C. fucking <laughs> crime. It looks like an anime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like someone took a fucking mop and cut the top off and slapped it on his head. I have a theory about the actor- actors. You know how we have a theory that uh, Matt presented a theory that everyone who unironically bought this movie got suckered into a reverse mortgage three times in the last year. <laughs> One of the conditions of a reverse mortgage is that you're an indentured su- servitude to to Susan media <laughs> you get like drafted to be in the movie yeah, yeah. <laughs> shut up you're playing john c calhoun <laughs> the Susan learned that con by the way from that guy in prison from rock, <laughs> yeah. from rock. and Damn then it, rock. all of them well yeah we, we by should... the way the only rock i've ever heard of in, in the context of african-american culture is the classic charles s dutton sitcom yes. from the yeah. 90s i never heard of that who was an like actual a... murderer yeah <laughs> i mean sure and a wonderful actor and everything but yeah. he, he, he killed a guy he did that's true yeah the, uh, I, we also joked that at the premiere of this movie, our uh, Rock's gang was giving life insurance policies to everyone who came to see the movie. <laughs> they wouldn't even have to kill him. Just a little bit of patience is a little, all that little was required. Hypertension a week later. <laughs> so, so, so much of this movie, it, 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 the historical part, is done in these incredibly lame reenactments, which which crosses over from corny to like actually nauseating when he uh, uses. African American actors to play slaves, and he he lingers on their lynching and whippings at the hands of vile, evil Democratic politicians over and over again. And perhaps most 
uh, like actually the most revolting thing in this movie is when he uses uh, the radical Republican journalist Ida B. Wells as a stand-in for himself. He was like, Ida B. Wells is the Dinesh D'Souza of her era because she was standing up to the Democratic Party and lynchings. And I just, we were wondering watching this movie, what did the actress who was cast in the part of Ida B. Wells think she was participating in? When she in? finally saw it, she's like, I thought this was an episode of Drunk History. <laughs> <laughs> Drunk on truth, maybe. <laughs> so we get like this history of the Democratic Party that pretends that, that you're learning for the first time that the Democratic Party was the party of slavery and white supremacy in the 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, there's, a, there's, of course, they were the party of the Ku Klux Klan and Nathan Bedford Forrest, and who they assassinated Abraham Lincoln, the first Republican president. Can we talk about the Lincoln part for a second? Yeah, Virgil. Talk about Lincoln and the Ku Klux Klan part of the movie. So they had, like, as bad as the Calhoun costume was, they had, like, the worst fucking birthday party rental Lincoln there. <laughs> there was no continuity. I don't know if you noticed this, but in one scene he has a beard, and in another scene he doesn't. And he's just a clean-shaven Lincoln with these long sideburns that are neatly trimmed, just like some asshole you'd see walking around Bedford Avenue. No, yeah, he what in the first scene... He had uh, no beard at all. And it was Lincoln's second inaugural that he was saying, which means he definitely would have had a beard. And then another one, he had a beard that didn't connect to his sideburns. Yeah. And then the third one, he had the full so beard. All, all, up to this point, just awful hair, awful costumes, awful props that are like done by the same guys who did props for Repo Man. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then there's this dramatic scene about the assassination of a, a, a what is it, a, a, a Reconstruction Republican yeah. by the Klan. And you see these Klan guys right in. And they, the, these clan robes they're wearing are the most accurate, <laughs> detailed costumes yeah. in the yeah. whole movie. Like they put extra work into them. Maybe they just had. Them. Yeah, yeah. Every, 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 everything else in the movie, it's like it, it's like slaves wearing fubu and like <laughs> a, a fucking Abraham Lincoln as a soul patch. But with the clan, and Dinesh is like, yeah, whatever. But when top, top hat, the Kango when hat. The KKK, <laughs> when, uh, when the KKK came in, he's like, no, that rank is all wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they had ranks and everything. <laughs> yeah, Grand Wizard. Like they even had the the red Grand Wizard's robe. They had all the correct like insignias and everything. We had the idea of like a uh, uh, stealing clan valor. Yeah. Who is yeah. your imperial dragon, sir? <laughs> you know that people uh, got fired from the gas station wearing that outfit. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so for some reason, uh, as we as we noticed, the the Ku Klux Klan outfits in this movie were incredibly good. Co I mean, shiny. Th these were not bed sheets. These were like shiny, just yeah. gleaming one, one, robes. One call to Jeff Sessions is all. It's like, <laughs> like, <laughs> hook uh, me, hook me up, would you, Jeff? <laughs> oh, I can look into my summer stock. <laughs> <laughs> so then it gets to the, the, this thing where Dinesh has to account for like uh, the, the switch in party allegiance in, in, in the 20th century. Or like, he's saying that like, Democrats always talk about the civil rights movement in the 60s, but they neglect the more important civil rights movement, which was reconstruction and abolitionism, which took place in the 19th century and, and uh, the Civil War. And that was when, you know, Lincoln and the Republicans are the part, and Frederick Douglass is a Republican, blah, blah, blah. And then he gets into this idea that like, there's this big switch in party identification post-civil rights movement, where the Republican, the, what was formerly the Racist Democratic South became the racist Republican South. Can, can I just talk about one moment where Woodrow Wilson is watching Birth of a Nation oh, in yes, the White yes. House? Yes. And and the, the Klansman on the horse literally comes out of the screen and he basically comes in his pants like, <laughs> like a guy, and then chases him out onto the but lawn. It, like, Woodrow Wilson was like, uh, you know, those like fucked up teens that watched Avatar and wanted to kill themselves because they wanted to live in the blue world. Right? That was Woodrow Wilson. Right. He's like, what a beautiful experience. <laughs> it was basically the last the la last action hero yeah. with the Klan. Yeah. But again, it shows how uh, th 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 this works because like, again, th th he there there's there's always like a kernel of real history here. Woodrow Wilson was a deeply racist Absolutely. president. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he's referring to the time when he they screened D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation at the yeah. White House. And Woodrow Wilson's famous quote about it was, it was like history written in lightning. But of course, in Dinesh's like literal mind, he shows like the Klan lightning like creates it and rides out. And Woodrow Wilson literally chases this <gasps> ghostly apparition oh. onto the White House lawn and is like, Shane, Shane, come back. <laughs> Woodrow Wilson. Also a big figure of inspiration for neoconservatives' foreign policy ambitions. But, you know, yeah. God forbid Dinesh bring that up. Don't, don't get off the narrative, man. <laughs> no, the scene with Birth of a Nation was incredible. And again, it's funny because the, the image of 
uh, free, newly freed uh, African American, uh, newly freed slaves that D.W. Griffith portrays in *Birth of a Nation* is exactly the portrayal of contemporary African American culture that Dinesh D'Souza parodied at both the Dartmouth Review and in his book *The End of Racism*. Exactly. They hold the exact same view um, of just like a pathological, just sort of ch- almost childlike culture. Um, so yeah, so like then he gets to this this thing where he uses logic to prove that the modern Republican Party is in no way tainted by the uh, the racism of dem- the Democrats of of the past, and what he does there's an amazing line in it where he says it's quite simple really, as the South got less racist, it got more Republican. <laughs> <laughs> This is uh, well, like I think I think we watched this with Nick, and Nick said that like it's sort of like saying as AIDS ravages your body's <laughs> immune system, you're actually getting healthier. Right? Yeah, yeah. The other thing he does, he brings up the example of Strom Thurmond, right, as the the er example of racist uh, Ku Klux Klan Democrat who became an arch conservative Republican, and he's like. Let's look at this in context. How many Strom Thurmonds really, there was Strom Thurmond, but how many really switched allegiance? And what he does is he creates a graphic of blue and red, and he adds up all of the Democratic politicians since the, the, the party existed. Yes, <laughs> since no. Andrew Jackson. Since yeah. Andrew Jackson. And, and counting as switching to uh, Counts Whigs as Republicans. Yep. Even though they weren't really, they were their own thing. He takes the enti- every Democratic politician from the time when there literally wasn't a Republican Party, and then adds them up, and there's like four that switched. But and th- and then it all brushes away, and then all the de- it just spells out lie. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, the big switch is a big lie, and then it just yeah. says lie in case you were uh, confused at all. From there, he moves f- from the Democratic Party's history of slavery. He moves on into their history uh, with crime and the Progressive Era. And through that, he he again he comes to the character of Saul Alinsky. This oh is the- God, this is so good. And he gives a, a history of Saul Alinsky, the radical community organizer, who, who apparently he- was an intern for Al Capone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He was getting college credit <laughs> right. for finding out how the mafia worked in Chicago. As Dinesh portrays Frank Nitti's like buddy. Yeah. As Dinesh portrays it in this movie, he basically interned with Frank Nitti yeah, yeah. and you know taught them how to do better crime because he was in fact more ruthless than they right. were. <laughs> Frank ooh. Nitty's like, you're a heartless scumbag, man. <laughs> ooh, ooh uh, Mr. Capone, have you thought about blaming racism for market forces? <laughs> and when I was watching the Frank Nitty reenactments, I was like, God, he should have gotten Billy Drago right. to do <laughs> Frank <laughs> Nitty again. Yeah. That would have been so good. Lipless motherfucker. He's like, <laughs> hey, you friend, he died screaming like a stuck Irish pig. No, he was talking Billy- about the estate tax. <laughs> Your friend, he died screaming like Ambassador Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Drago would have done it. Too. Yeah, oh hell yeah, uh, he would. He would have done this movie for sure. And all, the other part of the Saul Alinsky section that I really loved was when uh, it showed like Saul Alinsky got like he was the, the light first went off in his head about his life of crime. He was at a a lunch counter where you would pay with a ticket. Yeah, it was like the old like style deli, an automat, automat the, where you'd yeah. pay with a ticket, like after getting your food. And he devised an ingenious scheme to uh, pretend that he had lost a ticket, pay for a coffee when he had really had a sandwich, then take the ticket to a different automat, and they then, use the same ticket system. Yeah, and the same, they have to be the exact same ones. And he so was, he, yeah, he started off as a meatloaf stealer, the son of a bitch. And then he organized the whole gang of community organizers, if you will, to like you know branch out over Chicago and rip off automats. Oh, they're mashed potatoes and shit. I mean, like what you said, Felix. I can't say it, but what you said is that oh, all this. Uh, I'll, I'll say it. I don't want you to get in trouble for this. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, man. That's why we work well. You're together. the lightning rod, right? Yeah. <laughs> Dinesh like skips the step where he's supposed to explain how Alinsky invented like modern liberal big Chicago crime politics. And it just like, and Alinsky was a cheap Jew. <laughs> That's like the entire thing about how why Alinsky's bad is it's just Alinsky going to restaurants and being like, "How is it stealing if they have the noive to charge a quarter for a sandwich?" <laughs> That's the it's message. Such bad food and so little of it. That's the message I got from the Capone scene. It's that it's not that Saul Alinsky was this brutal guy. He was just looking through their uh, fucking accounting books, going, "You could save more money actually if you cut these assassins." <laughs> I've got a lot of overhead here. I think. <laughs> You just saved us 50, Randy. 
<laughs> so from there it goes like into the the progressive era of Democrats, and then there's this whole thread about Democrats and eugenics, and they bring on. Oh, National Review uh, columnist and author Jonah Goldberg. He interviews Jonah Goldberg in this movie. The guy's got a magnifying screen presence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He literally chews the scenery. I mean, you could. T- <laughs> <laughs> the opening video of the Democratic Convention in 2012. The government is the one thing we all belong to. Is, no, government belongs to us. We don't belong to it. What are these Democrats hiding? I mean, you know that that is why. Dinesh had him on so that he would comparatively look masculine and have like yeah. you know charismatic he, black hole of charisma. Yeah. <laughs> the only I, I went home after we saw this last night and tried to like jot down notes and the only one note I have for Jonah Goldberg is what a fucking cumwad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they actually had to get. They actually had to find a special restaurant to shoot with Jonah that would allow him to breastfeed <laughs> during the conversation. Goldberg has this like grouper like mouth that's framed by the world's worst goatee, and and it, I like, don't know. Steven Seagal is still alive. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. but you know what? Goldberg's mouth when he talks it reminds me of the the, the Terry Gilliam animation in uh, Monty Python, yeah. where it's just like, like it's just like it's just a joint yeah. of like the the, the 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 face is just split and just talks like like a like a hinged or a South Park Canadian. Yeah, the South Park Canadian <laughs> thing. So Jonah Goldberg comes on to make his case that you know progressivism is fascism, which is communism, and he's like. He's like the the New Republic, the the flagship magazine of liberalism in the 1920s, wrote glowingly about Benito Mussolini and fascism, and it's like, uh, yeah, Jonah, the uh, National Review, the flagship magazine of conservatism, mm. uh, wrote very glowing things, quite closer to present yeah. day than the New Republic did in the ch- 20s. Let's check out their uh, Augusto Pinochet uh, obit from like five years ago. And like I, and again, this cuts against like his whole thesis. Genie, you're free. <laughs> 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 Pinochet taught me it was okay to be different at dark time. <laughs> so they they have they have the the, the 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 Joan ad come on to talk about how how you know Democrats are the real racists, but like the National Review, which was the the post civil rights flagship conservative magazine, was explicitly founded against the civil rights movement. Right, that was Buckley's famous quote about standing athwart history. He was talking about Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement at the time. It would seem to cut against Dinesh's thesis. Then Goldberg tells some story that he's like, everybody should know the story of Becky Crud, the woman. <laughs> who, you know, <laughs> everybody should know about Miss Crud. She was. She was forcibly ster- she was deemed a, a mentally a mental halfwit and f- sterilized against her will. And then it gets into this whole Margaret Sanger thing about how progressivism is eugenics, blah blah blah. But J- Jonah Goldberg again, without any self awareness, is sort of like, oh, he's like sterilization is no joke. Can you imagine a woman being held down, medically violated, and forced to have a serious medical procedure against her will? Uh, yeah, I know. yes, That'd be terrible. Yeah, that would be terrible, Jonah. I agree. Yeah, he's a dullard. Holy shit! And then there's all this whole thing where like. Uh, the crime model, right, is that Democrats want to give uh, rights to immigrants and black people specifically, not because they think it would be good for them, but because they want their votes, right? And it becomes part of this machine Which crime. Which is like literally politics. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, they force these guys to vote for them by giving them policies that they would prefer to the other party. Yeah. They, uh, just one quick thing. Back to Margaret Sanger. They actually, yeah. he dug up a, 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 a Hillary at a Planned Parenthood right, event yes. and saying, Margaret Sanger, you know, basically saying Hillary is pro-eugenic. She makes the most delicious fetuses. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to be the type of first lady that was stuck in the kitchen baking fetuses. <laughs> <laughs> so on the one hand, he's saying the Democrats are the party of eugenics. And again, this is all based in, this is real history. The, much of the progressive movement was shot through with this weird, uh, with the, eugen- mm. the eugenic movement. And there were fascist elements to Woodrow Wilson and a lot of the progressive era but it's this thing where like he's like okay the democrats believe in sort of racial hygienics and they want to stop the prevent the propagation of non-white races through birth control and abortion and things like that but they also want to propagate those races so that they will vote for them and win every election he he, like trips over his dick within a minute of his like (laughs) for one thesis we gotta wipe out kill them all but get their votes yeah 
later. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, you, you let him vote when they're dead. See, he should have done more yeah, with Daly. Oh, yeah. It's like, yeah, just get him, get the birth certificates. And Saul Alinsky will get their houses. <laughs> Sell just to close out the Saul Alinsky thing, uh, he like has some just throwaway line where he's like, Saul Alinsky who dropped dead in California. Like, he didn't say it's weird. He just sort of, like, implies that there's something nefarious about him dropping dead rather than just he died in the 70s because he was an old man. I imagine that, like, the implication is that God struck him down for his insolence and but, uh, criminality or something. <laughs> Virgil, I like your comment about... Which comment? Uh, sorry, yeah, about... Uh, he dropped that he starved to death because they stopped making the ticket automat restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he he goes to the progressive area. By the time he gets to the at, like the civil rights movement of the 20th century, he can't even really be bothered to do the the old conservative thing to like argue that Martin Luther King was actually a conservative because he wanted people to be judged by their character and not race. He just sort of says that like uh, the, 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 he said he says at one point all the civil rights movement did was, you know, recognize uh, the constitutional rights that Republicans had already created. But, like, he doesn't mention, like, the, the actual political struggle involved in that or the fact that Lyndon Johnson was the guy who made it happen and was a Democrat. And, again, he brings up the fact that Lyndon Johnson was personally racist, which is true, but, like, it's in service of this completely fraudulent uh, view of history and the civil rights movement. Well, they have, a you know, a, a, an actor playing Johnson going, we need their votes. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, kind of, it's sort of basic politics 101, right? There was this, uh, <laughs> God, there's the one part where he's on Air Force One and uh, Johnson just, like, lets the N-word slip. And oh, there's, yeah. uh, there's a black student yeah, yeah, uh, just behind him, and like <laughs> Johnson doesn't know, and you cut to that guy and he's ruefully just, shaking his head. I'm surprised they didn't go with the American Indian pollution single tear rolling down his yeah. cheek. I that wish they had shown nice. Johnson on the can, though. That really would have <laughs> been the coup de gras. I wish they'd shown his legendary <laughs> penis. Yeah. yeah, there's a scene where a Republican goes, uh, I think black people should vote for us because of moral duty, not because we give them things. And Johnson just takes his dick out. Like, this is the plantation. <laughs> <laughs> he unfurls his hog and it's got whites only written on yeah. it. Uh, Johnson's cock is actually next to Jackson's whip in the DS. <laughs> <laughs> Cut to Milton Berle going, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, I thought I was packing them off. So he gets to Obama, and then he does. He loves using audio clips from Obama's book, Dreams of My Father, where Obama is in his own voice reading the book and describes being in a black barber shop where they complain about Democratic politicians being like a plantation. But then he describes a scene from Obama's childhood oh where he God. tells oh people, God. he tells the kids in his mostly white school that his dad is like a prince in Africa. And like, then there's a... Uh, like, you know, uh, uh, a parent's day, you know, like where your parents would come and tell everyone what they do for a living. And in the reenactment, in the reenactment, Obama's dad comes to class with a spear <laughs> and a yeah. leopard hat and a leopard, leopard hat, hat and shakes it at the students. And it's 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 like the scene in CB4 where it's like, I'm black, I'm black, <laughs> no, I'm biggity, biggity black. The, the, dude, the dad literally goes, the first thing the dad says while you're in class holding a spear and a leopard hat is... I am from Africa. And the teacher and it, the teacher says, Now Barack, I hope your dad brought enough dog for the whole class. <laughs> the, and then like the hook to this scene, like the reason reason that the elder Obama is bad is because he like spellbinds the class by talking about like, you know, uh a cool I mean like the way that Dinesh directed this scene, he might as well have like boiled the teacher in a pot. <laughs> but yeah. like you know, of course the dad is like the po in the actual book, like the dad is charismatic and spellbinding, and Obama's like, "Wow, I was so amazed by how he could keep everyone's attention." But Dinesh starts playing like the horrible dramatic music, and the implied thing here is that it's like it's bad if people like you. <laughs> you know, like, like they would cut back to him and Jonah at the restaurant, and they're, he's like, "Everyone in the restaurant spit on me and Jonah," which is how you know that we're moral. <laughs> right. We're not like the Obamas. Even, Everyone hates the shit out of us. Even in his twisted uh, logic, there, I, I I lost the thread in the dad scene. Like I I, I, his, I didn't his, yeah I didn't get his what point it is, seemed to be that he was he was embarrassed when his dad was going to show up. He was like, oh brother, dad, what are you going to do? Oh no, I told him all my dad was African, but he's actually Saul Alinsky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what I do every day at work is that I give them the wrong ticket, and I have saved approximately. I eat a lot of chicken a la king free. <laughs> I am an African, <laughs> but but then the dad is really charismatic and and. 
I, you can see young baby Obama's growing pride, and it seems to imply that dad taught me how to communicate and to bullshit people. Or so, I mean, that's the best I could yeah, really yeah. grab from but it. But the dad doesn't even bullshit people. People just like like him yeah, because yeah. he's a compelling speaker. But Nash is like, this is where his empire of lies. All right. I can imagine, though, seeing that scene is, did his dad bring that spear on the airplane from Africa to Hawaii. Yeah. Like, did he yeah, check did, it? Did he bring it on? To, like, did they let him put it into the closet? It was in the pre nine eleven. You could just you could bring a broadsword. Might have been a plane. collapsible. <laughs> but that yeah that that is the uh, that is the lesson that Obama uh, that being a, a uh, good father who uh, plays along for your uh, son's benefit is bad. Uh, and being as uh, unliked uh, gnome person who's <laughs> yeah. racist, yeah, it's like that's personal, good actually. Yeah, any kind of like uh, you know, oh, the, any kind of personality, positive personal traits that make you amenable to other people and make them like you is basically cheating. That's cheating. Right. Well, I mean, I feel like, like you have to, you're only like a truly virtuous person if you're able to have influence in society through the sheer force of your ideas because you personally are a repellent piece of shit. It's so the Ted Cruz thesis. Yeah, 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 yeah. We must make the most of our moment to fight for freedom, to protect our God-given rights, even of those with whom we don't agree, so that when we are old and gray... There's booing going on here. And when our work is... And it's like, I feel like this... Part, like Dinesh with Obama specifically, Dinesh shows his ass the most because, like, if you, you his last movie, which is about Obama and how Obama was purposely going to destroy America because his dad was like an anti colonialist. But then you start looking at the two men, okay, both children of immigrants who went to elite schools and were sort of like fast tracked as young wonderkin in their respective mm -hmm. political slots. And you have Obama, who just like you know, success after success, like just enraptured people. Whenever you got it, gave him a chance to speak in front of people. You know, no matter what you think of the guy's policies, we've obviously criticized a lot, but just you know, an icon to tens of millions of people, beloved. Uh, you have Dinesh, who's just like had similar beginnings, but is now known for like as. <laughs> Virgil pointed out, cut campaign law breaking <laughs> right. and like writing books that are like, yo, honky, I ain't pulling up my pants right. that everyone <laughs> hates. So Obama is bad because, you know, he was endorsed and carried through his career by the literal personal endorsement of millions of people who took the action of voting for him. Meanwhile, Denise D'Souza is able to put a roof over his head because like five billionaire goblins have like, <laughs> underwritten his career his entire life and no actual citizen has ever given a scintilla of a fuck about anything he's ever had to say well i mean his actually the, uh, the his the obama documentary was quite successful oh it's like all that bullshit the books too come on yeah. but like they're, they're fucking buying out uh theaters and ha and like wheeling in old people to watch well actually stuff. uh here, here's the line uh from his book and I, I don't know if this is in the documentary but this is in his book 2016 obama's america this is his line about uh think about think about this in the scene where obama's father sh literally shakes a spear at his classmates he said dinesh writes the most powerful country in the world is being governed according to the dreams of a luau tribesman of the 1950s a polygamist who abandoned his wives drank himself into a stupor and bounced around on two iron legs i don't know what that means <laughs> Uh, what? what? Raging Wait, he's he's a Wait a cyborg. Minute. Wait a minute. Robocop is uh, Obama's dad? Obama's dad built a Gundam to repel the <laughs> British Empire. He says, ra raging against the world for denying him the realization of his anti colonial ambitions. This philandering, inebriated African socialist is now setting the nation's agenda through the reincarnation of his dreams in his son. He does Obama for a little bit, but like in the movie called Hillary's America, he saves it till about the last quarter of the movie to be about Hillary and I found not that, not even do yeah not yeah. even it's, quarter, ten minutes. Six it's about the movie. it's about 10 minutes of the movie to, for him to actually get to his thesis on Hillary Clinton which is basically that she steals things but but here's what I found interesting about watching this movie let's say the first like three quarters of the movie so far has been among the most laughably incompetent abortion of American history that's basically ever been presented no one on earth could be persuaded by a single thing that he has said in that film Unless they are like just brain dead, the brain yeah. dead. Yeah. Unless yeah. they're, they're just, unless they're they're just yeah. a brain stem that yeah. you know, ambulates. Well, well, well uh, or like everyone who did see this movie, they went in there to agree with it. I, I mean, like the only people who like 
would have gotten their minds changed by that movie. They'd be like, well, Dinesh, I wish I could vote in this election, but I accidentally sold myself into servitude in China by uh, participating in a contest in the back of a Cracker Jack box. But, uh, <laughs> you really sold me. Uh, hold on. This uh, guy is uh, telling me I can have an ownership stake in the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> the change in direction when it gets to not just Hillary Clinton, but both of the Clintons and their various dealings is actually really instructive because it's the only effective part of the movie and the thing we were watching like thinking about what he's talking about all of the nasty shit they did in Haiti through the Clinton Foundation and just basically their their, their public record like if he had chosen to do a 90 minute documentary that was about the conduct of the Clinton Foundation he could have had an effective piece of agitprop from a right wing perspective and the thing that's incredible is that the his presentation of the Clintons actually lands because they are actually so fucking sleazy and crooked <laughs> that even an, just an absolute dull shithead like Dinesh D'Souza is capable of putting yeah. together a package Blind on them. Blind squirrel finding a nut. Yeah. Because like we talked about in his Obama movie, he doesn't land a glove once. No, because his thesis is insane. Yeah. Like his, yeah. de- it's like it's like genetic. His, it's like a theory of genetic ideology. Like he passed radical anti-colonialism through his sperm. Yeah, it's, right? it's a right. Lovecraft conservative thesis. <laughs> well, he does. You know, the, it is only like the last quarter or even fifth of the yeah. movie, but he does set the table early on in the scene with Rock, with his boy Rock. Uh, where he for what if the Democratic Party is stealing America? <laughs> it as so, but he 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 circles back to that when he gets to the Clinton, and that's how I think he imagined it lands. So, Bill, that's what I hated so much about this fucking movie is that he. Dinesh makes up this concept of a con. This is what he thinks a con is in his yeah. head. The thing that he puts in the character of Rock to tell him. And that con d- makes no sense. That's not how a fucking con no. works. It's no. like like a part of it is you uh, they pose as insurance guys and they, they give $5,000 checks to people <laughs> right. and then a few months later murder them and yeah. then get more money back. <laughs> it's asinine. I That's mean, how the dumb overhead it. on that fucking idea is insane. Like they had little laminated brochures to give everybody. Yeah. They were wearing suits they had a sales so this, force this, this it's is like if Christopher th- Molisanti got hit in the head with a brick and decided <laughs> like, to run something Dinesh you know, is too I, stupid to just explain what a Ponzi scheme is or something right. that's familiar or just look up any con yeah. but he invents this to use as a, a recurring metaphor for the Democratic Party and it doesn't map wait, at all w- w- no. wait I think it I doesn't. can interpret it through his broken brain <laughs> okay okay you remember the part where he gives them like five thousand dollars up front which by the way, would have run them about half a million dollars. To Yo, do. we just got to get a small business loan, <laughs> and then we start murdering old people. Well, that's okay. No one so, will connect the dots. So, so <laughs> the so the free money is like welfare and social security and Medicare, but murdering them is the death tax. <laughs> well, another thing he says in, in 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 Dinesh's conception of street knowledge is like when Rock hips him to the game. He's like, if you're going to start a game, the first thing you need to do. Is posed as a good guy who's doing has charitable intentions, and I'm like, did street gangs have all have names like the Bloods and like the Money <laughs> right. Murder Posse? Like, like posing as good guys is not what they do right yeah. off the bat. Uh, Dinesh uh, proposes that there are four aspects. He learns from Rock there are four aspects to every con, and they're just not aspects of a con. The fourth one is deny. What? <laughs> <laughs> but, like as this movie closes out, he's like Hillary's real plan is to steal America. Just like she learned from Saul Alinsky and like he learned from the Confederacy before <laughs> before before him. No, yeah, it's no, all no, one it goes, unbroken chain. Hillary, Obama, Saul Alinsky, Al Capone, then the Confederacy. Nathan Bedford Forrest. Nathan Bedford Forrest. Yeah, that's how it works. After it's that. it's a very complex organizational chart. I, I wrote actually wrote down the con formula. How this is how the Democrats steal America. <laughs> okay, good. One, yes. you plan. Two, you pitch. Three, you take. Four, you deny. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the the way he thinks the organized crime work is you go into a restaurant, you order a sandwich, you eat half of it, then you say it wasn't any good, then they right. give it for you for free, and then you go to another restaurant and eat the other half of the sandwich and say that right. wasn't any good, then you've eaten one sandwich for free. Then and people then you, ask if you've you've eaten a sandwich and you say no. No, I'm that's no. the deny part. You want to you want you want me to buy lunch? Yeah, I'm good. I haven't eaten yet. <laughs> and then we just do that on a national scale. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the old uh, the old Democrat con of uh, adding the Denny's Twitter account and saying your food was bad and asking for coupons. It's like, did you know Nathan Bedford Forrest was a Democrat? 
Did you know that the original Republican Party was anti Gamergate? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, he goes on. He finally gets to, to, to Hillary Clinton, and he, he does bring up Benghazi once. And like, he, like, he shows Hillary from behind, like, uh, watching. Watching it happen. Uh, watching it. Watching no, no, the no, no. Watching happen. the the flag Just drape. her chops. Watch, like, Ooh, kill well, more of them. Watching the flag <laughs> drape coffins like come out of the 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 C thirty one airship and like you know uh, being brought back to be buried. And Turns he's like, to the camera and, and he's like, like a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> and and his voiceover is like, now we know why she didn't try to save these four heroes. She didn't know how to make a buck off of them. <laughs> and again, like how like. How does that conception of crime work? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like it, like she took out a life insurance policy. <laughs> yeah, she I did. Know, she should have. Yeah. She, she took out yeah. life insurance. If she was policies. really doing that shit. She would have put a life insurance on everyone at the compound, then yeah. excite the Muslims, and then get them killed, and then cash the check. So it's like again, and it, it's so funny, like how even how out of date this movie is, even the fact that it was released like five months ago. So he gets to the end of this movie, and he's imploring the audience. He's like, I've given you this history lesson. This is Hillary Clinton. It goes all the way back to Andrew Jackson. And she's the exact same person. And I'm just, I'm imploring you. Can you imagine what would happen if we let people as depraved and corrupt as Bill and Hillary back into the White House? And it's like, well, Dinesh, we don't have to worry about that. Yeah. because they, they were defeated by someone even more crooked and depraved than they were. Yeah. <laughs> like literally, um, his stuff about the Clintons, and the stuff about Obama ruining the world at the beginning is like, we're, you know, we're letting Russia do anything now. <laughs> and it's like, imagine showing this to like a younger Trump voter, not yeah. like the, the octogenarians that Dinesh is pitching to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, like the, uh, the last Lord of the Rings movie. Uh, this movie also has about 15 places that it could have ended, but, oh but then God. just painfully kept going on and on. There are not one, but two musical montages to end this movie. And the first time it fades to black when we were watching it and we thought it was going to done and be like the song that the credits roll over, it fades to black. And right as it does, we were watching it with Nick Mullen. He just starts going, did the Clint Eastwood Grand Torino? He goes, in my Grand Torino. And I honestly, I nearly had a heart attack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so tenderly, your story is. Nothing more. Well, they they bring it to that uh, that piano man who's like a warmed over Mark Russell. Yeah, guy. yeah. And uh, that's a that's a bookend with the beginning where he leads the he leads the ensemble in, you know, as somebody who did song parodies on MST3K, crappy days are here again. <laughs> like he went for like, what's the most low hanging fruit rhyme we can we can <laughs> grab with like two seconds to go and. Um, yeah, and then and that then guy they... has like an actual pitch to the audience at the end. He's this like he's in a tux and tails, sitting at a grand piano. He's got like slicked back hair, glasses, and he's like, "America, it's up to you." He's like, "Yeah, he barred from Democrats Spike Lee." Win again. Like, do the right thing. <laughs> yeah. Turn to camera. Don't let a person get in the whole office who's going to use it for personal enrichment. <laughs> <laughs> and then actually, Matt and I watched. Okay, so then there's uh, there's a first musical montage. Mm -hmm. Then there's a whole like orchestral "God Bless America" with a little girl singing. And like flags waving and stock footage from other, and clips from other movies that I I, th I assumed he paid for. It reminded me of the end of of Soylent Green. <laughs> Just like the montage he's watching, just to, to die to. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful. That scene was reproduced in several theaters. Matt, you also said it reminded you of the uh, the brainwashing scene from Parallax. From Parallax view. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Holy yeah. Shit. I could definitely see somebody, uh, yeah, assassinating so a leader then, after then they the watch movie that. Then the movie The movie ends, and then they have the credits, and then there's another musical montage where it's. I looked this up. It's the Gatlin Brothers. It's the Gatlin Brothers. It's the Gatlin yeah. Brothers. So like, I think the name of the song is "I'm Gonna Start Saying Something." And it's the Gatlin Brothers music video that's like the, the theme song to the movie. You guys went out to have a cigarette. Matt and I actually watched the entire credit sequence. There's an Easter egg at the end. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, fucking that's it, That's what you get for being slaves to your addiction. <laughs> oh, yeah, the Easter egg is, is rich. There's an Easter egg at the end where it cuts back to uh, earlier in the, the Oz prison section of the movie. It talks about how he did work teaching uh, English as a second language to immigrants. Which he, was another tripping over his dick moment because he really, he like his, his whole point in that moment was I was subjected to this really harsh punishment because Obama you know had it out for me but he turns you know he turns to the camera at that point and he says teaching teaching english to immigrants 
They thought that was punishment. It's my kind of thing. Wait, it's also as he trips over his dick a second time with that because his entire scene with the progressive movement is like, oh, yeah, then they brought immigrants into America and gave them things. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, wait, but you're like, you're just teaching them English. But what he teaches it. them is American values. And at the, the Easter yeah. egg at the end of this movie is him closing out his class. And it's almost like the... Uh, sort of Mexican immigrants in his class are like the stand-in for the audience or the viewers who took this movie seriously. And he says to his class, how will you know when you're in... I got it right okay. down at the bottom. Yeah, here you go. He says, he says to him, he says, so how will you know when you've become an American? You'll know when you become a Republican. Uh, and, then and then the then, class cheers. Yeah. They, uh, they cheered because they don't speak English. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, that That's is, the no, funny that, thing is that like... They show him, and it's supposed to be his first day, and he starts talking, I'm going to tell you about America, and then he does that. There's no establishment that any of these people know what the fuck he's talking about. This is, again, from the... I just want to read from the Vanity Fair profile of Dinesh, after his life after conviction. He says that his time uh, in the clink has actually... It's led him to soften some of his stances, and he says... uh, he once believed that the quality of the immigrant is directly proportional to the distance they traveled to get here. But now I see now I see that wow. the adults in my class are incredibly industrious, determined, and hardworking, and no less strenuous in their pursuit of the American dream than any other immigrant group. And what I love about this is this is the Ness's actual moment of genuine naivete, where he's like, did you know that Mexican immigrants are actually hardworking and not criminals? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's adorable. I mean, no, it's awful, but it doesn't acknowledge that the reason that he loves the immigrants who are from farther away is that the farther away you had to come to become an immigrant to the United States, the more resources you had to get here. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I did yeah. he, he, Lucky he, immigrants like he, uh, he, Prince uh, Bandar Sultan. Yeah. <laughs> did, did he, now, Dinesh, as he is strange to point out, uh, did, did immigrate from Mumbai. His family's from Mumbai, but uh, he was actually from a Catholic family. He was ch- taught by Jesuits in India. But what he neglects to mention is he's from a very high caste family. Well, yeah, in India that's true. Of most Indian that that uh, yeah. that that had uh, that had very positive associations with British colonialism, unlike Obama's father, for instance. And yeah, like so, like that 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 sums up his whole worldview about immigrants in a nutshell. He also says at the end of this Vanity Fair thing, likewise, his own divorce has quote sobered and humbled me and made me a lot more tentative <laughs> about things I was sure about. It seems he's no longer convinced that the country's acceptance of divorce led to the destruction of the world trade. <laughs> Center. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. That was a hell of a moment for him yeah. because even other right wingers were like, "What are you?" I t- think what that you- if Sousa's time uh, in a minimum security part-time prison with the Rock, if that made him slightly less racist, then it sounds like Obama's re-education camp worked. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean that's that's Hillary's America. Thank God we've averted this crisis. Oh my God. Yeah. She would yeah. honestly like this movie stopped her from becoming president. Probably. There's no question about yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, right he's taking tracks. credit for yep. it. Yeah. There's a there's a a, a sponsored Twitter ad from it saying like see the movie that stopped Hillary that kind of thing like, imagine Trump watching that movie and he's like already forgotten all the things he said about Hillary and he's like what, why would you say that about such a good person <laughs> and second of all what's so bad about Russia like, <laughs> Dinesh would just grovel and recut the movie any closing thoughts on Dinesh D'Souza and Hillary's America I can't wait till he does it about Cory Booker <laughs> <laughs> Booker's America coming next. So, uh, if you want to watch this movie, I highly recommend not paying for it. Uh, if you'd like to, to do yeah, the, do it. Do a Saul Linsky there. And yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Work the scam and <laughs> then deny it. <laughs> you get, get a movie ticket to one of Michael Moore's documentaries with a side then, of mashed potatoes. <laughs> you just gotta buy one of those shrink wrap machines. You buy the DVD, you watch it, and then you put it back in the shrink wrap. You know, Frank Nitty is over in the corner going, "Oh, don't do that, man! <laughs> you monster!" Yeah. Oh no. Our, Fans of the show should uh, buy the movie and then try to return it to GameStop. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, I just want to say, Bill, Bill Corbett, thanks so much for uh, doing the show with us. What a pleasure, guys. It was nice spending some time with you. And on a a, a personal note, I'd just like to say, uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000, a show... It's probably so influential in my formative years. It took us several months to realize that we were just ripping you off on Chapo <laughs> Trap House. <laughs> you Alinskyite. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as a true Alinskyite myself, I've naturally gravitated towards waking up at uh, noon every day of my life. But the one day on a weekend I wouldn't do it as a child was when Mr. Sand <laughs> Cedar was on at nine on Comedy Central yeah. when I was a kid. And it was one of the things that broke my brain growing up. <laughs> so, yeah, I think we all have that in common.